So good evening, Gloucester Rotarians. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, if only virtually, to give you a short talk about Apollo 13, the mission from 1970 that, quote, had a few problems, unquote. So back in April 1970, the mission started as it did for Apollo 8 and 10 and 11 and 12 with the launch of the mighty Saturn V rocket. On board were the three astronauts in the middle, the commander Jim Lovell, on the right the lunar module pilot Fred Hayes, and on the left it should have been the command module pilot Ken Mattingly, but Ken Mattingly was exposed to German measles shortly before the launch and so he was swapped with the backup command module pilot, which was Jack Swigert. So these three were the three heroes, if you like, that actually went on the Apollo 13 mission. So what I'm talking about this evening, as much as anything, is I think you probably already know, and you can cast your mind back 53 years to 1970, to the accident of Apollo 13, where they had a major catastrophe, a loss of power, and then there were the heroic efforts of the people in mission control back on the ground to get the three astronauts safely back to Earth. The whole story was immortalised in the Hollywood film of the 1995 era, which I'm guessing, again, many of you will already have seen. So if you're going to get three actors to portray the three crew of Apollo 13, What's the most famous astronaut you can get to be a part of the big screen? Well, the most famous astronaut of the day, of course, was. Yeah, because in 1995, that's when Toy Story came out as well. But they decided to go a slightly different way. And for the command module pilot, they had Kevin Bacon play that part. For the commander, Jim Lovell, that was Tom Hanks himself. And for the lunar module pilot, Fred Hayes, that was Bill Paxton. So they got these three Hollywood A-listers to play the three astronauts. But as well as the Apollo 13 saga, if you like, played out in the Hollywood film, the whole idea of Apollo 13, having an accident and getting the three astronauts home thanks to the efforts of mission control, not only was that immortalised in film some 25 years after it happened, but also it was committed to another medium, and that was Lego. So a Lego kit, I'm not sure it ever found it into the toy shops, but there's a Lego kit of Apollo 13. You can see in the background the spacecraft, which I'll say more about shortly, and then we have the three astronauts. But the real heroes of the day were the people in mission control, represented by these three Lego minifigures at the front here. If we have a look at a little more detail there, there's the uh, three members of Mission Control with their electronics and their displays and their red phone, presumably a hotline to the president, and the Apollo 13 emergency plan manual sitting on the front desk there, as well as the most important element of Mission Control, which is a hot mug of coffee. If we have a look at those three in a little more detail, there in the middle is the flight director. I assume that's supposed to be Gene Kranz, one of the most famous individuals, looking rather stern with a buzz cut there, and most importantly, the white waistcoat, or vest as they would call them in America, made by his wife. On either side, a couple of uh, engineers. You can tell they're engineers because they've got slide rules in their top shirt pockets. There's the astronauts, again, immortalized as Lego minifigures. The commander, Jim Lovell, in the middle there, looking relatively happy. Lunar module pilot, Fred Hayes, on the right, with a little bit of a smirk. But on the left-hand side, there's Swigert, with an absolute grimace on his face. I assume that they actually produce the um, facial expressions like this, A, to tell the three astronauts apart, but also because it was Swigert that actually threw the switch that caused the problem. He wasn't, of course, responsible for the accident, but ultimately, in a sense, he was because he threw the switch, which ultimately caused an explosion which crippled the spacecraft. But it's interesting that they decided to put different expressions on the three astronauts. 
There's the uh, rather crude LEGO model because of the scale involved. It's a rather crude model of the lunar module in the distance that was supposed to be landing on the moon. The conical command module where the astronauts spent a lot of their time and the cylindrical service module at the back, which provides the, the fuel and the oxygen and the water to keep the astronauts alive. This is the cylindrical service module, so-called because it services the life support needs of the astronauts. This is where the problem arose and the LEGO model has it before and after the explosion which blew off the side of the spacecraft and ruptured the fuel cells and caused them so many problems. It's not as detailed as other LEGO models, so this one is made to a different scale, and this one was brought out for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing uh, a couple of years earlier. Oh, sorry, uh, a year or so earlier. And so this one was commemorating 50 years since Apollo 11, and so with a rather larger scale, they could put a little more detail into the lunar module itself. So let's have a think about the abbreviations. I'm going to use these abbreviations to a lot, so let's just make sure we understand the geometry of the Apollo spacecraft. The service module, the cylindrical service module with an engine on the back that provides the fuel and the oxygen and the water for the astronauts and the power for the engine at the back here, this nozzle from the propulsion engine, which is the main source of propulsion. In the middle, the conical section is the command module, which is where the, uh, the three astronauts are strapped in for launch and will spend a lot of their time on the mission. And on the right, there's the lunar module, sometimes referred to as the LEM, because originally, a long time ago, it was referred to as the lunar excursion module, hence LEM, even though it was later changed to simply the lunar module. And the abbreviations we're going to use throughout the talk is the service module is SM, the command module is CM, the lunar module is LM. No surprises there. But one more point, sometimes because the service module and command module spend most of their time connected together, they are sometimes referred to as one spacecraft called the CSM, the command and service module. So let's have a think about how the Apollo missions were supposed to happen. So what was supposed to happen if Apollo 13 went originally to plan. Well, the Saturn V would have got it off the surface of the Earth and would have got it on its way to the Moon. And we're not going to go through the details, but uh, the, uh, the service module, the command module and the lunar module aren't actually packed away in the Saturn V in that configuration. They have to undergo a docking maneuver to extract the lunar module from its fairing. But ultimately, once it's on its way to the Moon, it looks like that. And the idea is it spends about three days on its way from the Earth on its way to the Moon, where very little of any great interest happens. Along the way, the astronauts will spend some of their time in the lunar module just prepping it for landing. But the three heroic astronauts spend a lot of their time inside the command module. But when they're ready to go down on the Moon, Two of them, the commander and the lunar module pilot, will move into the lunar module, leaving the command module pilot Swigert sitting in the command module. So Lovell and Hayes down to the moon, Swigert staying in the command module. Once they've transferred and the, uh, the airlocks are closed off, then the lunar module will detach and go down onto the lunar service. Yes, I know the astronauts aren't hanging on to the leg as it goes down, but for the purpose of illustration, two astronauts go down with the lunar module. They then spend a fun day or two kicking around the, the surface, going on various moonwalks, etc. When they're ready to come home, the top half of the lunar module detaches from the bottom and rendezvous again with the command and service module. So the descent stage stays on the moon. So there's a number of those littering the moon as we speak. Once they have redocked in lunar orbit, the two astronauts then transfer back from the lunar module, taking the lunar rocks with them. Remember, they've collected a few rocks on the surface. So they go back into the command module, taking a few rocks with them. So you then end up with your three astronauts back in the command module. Once you've got everybody safe in the command module, you don't need the lunar module anymore. There's no point in taking it home. It can't come through the Earth's atmosphere. It's far too fragile. And so rather than take dead weight with you, the lunar module is jettisoned 
and either, depending on the mission, the lunar module might end up going around the sun, going around the moon, or crashing onto the surface of the moon. Now the three astronauts are safely in the command module, they can start their journey home, which is another relatively boring three days getting from the moon back to the Earth. Once they've arrived back at the Earth, the service module, which has been providing them with the fuel for the main engine and water and oxygen and power, that no longer serves any purpose because they're now just a short distance away from Earth, and so they can jettison the service module, no longer required. That will expose a heat shield on the back end of the conical command module. That's what's going to protect them when they make the final leg to Earth and come through the Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the Pacific. Yes, I know that's not the Pacific. That just happens to be a nice picture of the Earth. It looks like they're landing in the Indian Ocean. No, that's just because that particular graphic shows the Indian Ocean. They actually landed roughly in the middle of the Pacific, giving them quite a, large, uh, quite a nice large margin of error. So that's how the Apollo missions are supposed to happen, and that's how most of them happened, with the exception of Apollo 13. So what actually happened? Well, it all started pretty much the same way. They started en route to the moon. It should take three, day, three days, but a little over halfway, they had a problem. Bang. And then the immortal words, Houston, we've had a problem. They weren't sure for quite a while what the problem was. There was a loud explosion. They had, it took quite a while to get the, the two spacecraft under control rather than gyrating around and uh, causing all sorts of problems in terms of control and stability. Now, at the time, the windows in the command module and the windows in the lunar module would not allow the astronauts a view of where the problem arose at the back end of the service module. Later, much later, they actually took a picture of where the problem was and you can see an entire panel of the service module has completely blown away because of an explosion. They later decided what had actually happened. At the time they weren't sure, but the, uh, the investigation afterwards determined that in one of the oxygen tanks, there was some faulty wiring to one of the fans. The tanks are designed to be stirred to make sure that the content of the tanks, in this case oxygen, are uniformly distributed throughout the tank, otherwise they tend to settle a little bit. So every once in a while, the cryo tanks, the, ox the very cold oxygen tanks, are stirred. And in this particular case, Swiger threw the switch to stir the oxygen tank Unfortunately, that caused a spark. The spark ignited the oxygen and basically the oxygen tank explode and exploded and took an awful lot of other equipment with it. Perhaps most importantly, it damaged the fuel cells as well as blowing out a side panel of the service module. The fuel cells take oxygen and hydrogen, combine them together to provide water and power. Fuel cells are a wonderful invention. British, I might add. So without all of the fuel cells running, they did have more than one, but without all of the fuel cells producing power, they had a real problem. They had a problem with the water and they had a problem having lost oxygen. They've obviously lost some breathing oxygen. They've lost the ability to make lots of water and they've lost most of their power. So this is indeed a real problem. So you have three people in the command module, not panicking, of course, because they are astronauts and they are trained to deal with emergencies. But very quickly, the astronauts and mission control came to the conclusion they would have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. The command module could not get its power from the service module because the service module was so badly damaged. Not only that, they dared not fire the engine unnecessarily. So they relied on the fact that the lunar module has got its own independent engine and independent fuel. So the three astronauts are now in the lunar module lifeboat. How are they going to survive? Well, in 
interestingly enough, there were contingency plans. They had thought through what would happen if we are trying to get back from the moon and we have a three day trip ahead of us. And what if the command and service module has been crippled by some accident? So they had con contingency plans for how they would deal with a three day trip back from the moon. The problem is, although they had that as a contingency plan, they were on the way to the moon and they were only a little more than halfway. They were something like four days away from getting back to the Earth. They thought about the option, do we turn around and go back to Earth? But that would have needed a huge amount of fuel, which they didn't really have. So they decided to go on and go around the back of the moon, use the moon as a slingshot, as it were, and then come back. But that would be a four day journey. So they continued on to the moon, went around the moon and then took a long, long, long trip back to Earth. So the question, how could they ensure that with the loss of oxygen, the loss of water, the loss of power, how would they survive long enough to get home over a four day period? Well, all of the details are covered in the 1995 film. And if you haven't seen it, I can thoroughly recommend it. It's a very accurate portrayal of all the trials and tribulations they went through to try and ensure that the astronauts survived. In essence, they powered down everything on the side of the command module and the service module. They could not afford to drain any remaining power from the systems on this side. They relied entirely on the power and the heat from the lunar module, but everything had to be turned down to a minimum. They had to worry about the fact that they were in the lunar module, which was not designed to carry three people. It's not simply a question of space. It's a question of their breathing out carbon dioxide, which has to be scrubbed from the atmosphere. And it's only designed to do that for two people for a few days, not three people for four days. So there are those sorts of problems. And you have to worry about the fact that if you're powering everything down, everything is going to get very cold. So it was a very uncomfortable trip for the astronauts returning over those four days. So I'm sure the sight of the Earth getting larger and larger in their windows was very much a sight that they could warm to, knowing that hopefully before too long they would be returning to Earth. When they did finally get back to Earth, four very uncomfortable days later, they had managed to get round the problem of exhaling a lot of CO2 and making sure that was scrubbed to the system. But they still had the problem that there was very little power in the command and service modules. And one thing they had to ensure was that they had enough power to actually bring the command module back to Earth. That means they had to power everything back up again that had been dead for four days. Dead and extremely cold. So there was lots of water condensing on all of the electric panels, for instance. They weren't even sure that they had enough power to make sure that the parachutes were not simply blocks of ice, because ultimately when they come through the Earth's atmosphere, they have to make sure that the parachutes deploy before landing in the ocean. So they had lots of problems to deal with, and that's where the work of mission control really came into its own, determining what the protocols were for how you power up a spacecraft that has been dead for four days. But that's basically what they had to do. They transferred, once they had got close to Earth, they transferred back from, excuse me, they transferred back from the lunar module back to the command module. The lunar module had effectively done its job of keeping them alive for four days. At this point, the service module was of no use to them whatsoever. They were still drawing the last little bit of power from the lunar module so they could let the service module go. And once it had jettisoned and drifted away from the command module, it is that point at which they got the first photographs of the damage that had occurred and the damage that had been inflicted on the service module. And at that point, they started thinking, aren't we lucky to be alive at all with the amount of damage suffered? Having decided, right, we're nearly at Earth, 
the lunar module lifeboat has basically done its job. It's provided us with a, a home, albeit a rather cold one, for the last four days. It's provided us with power. The last little bit of power is used to power up the command module and hopefully make sure that the parachutes are defrosted. And just everybody is hoping that the heat shield on the back end of the command module was not damaged by the explosion of the service module itself. So at this point, they let the lunar module go. The lunar module uh, codenamed, uh, and, uh, sorry, Aquarius. So there's a farewell Aquarius, we thank you. And at that point, they just keep their fingers crossed that the heat shield is still in one piece, that the parachutes will open, and then the command module splashes down pretty much according to schedule. Quite a long blackout before Mission Control got the OK that everybody on board was fine. Failure is not an option. The famous phrase was spoken by the actor Ed Harris in the 1995 film, but it wasn't spoken by Krantz himself. In Krantz's autobiography, well, he did actually use Failure is Not an Option as the title of his autobiography because he thought it reflected so succinctly the attitude of those working in mission control. What was actually said in the, at the time is something more like, how are we going to get those astronauts home? Well, we have a number of options and failure is not one of them. You can see that failure is not an option was a much more succinct way of saying the same thing. But that was the attitude of everybody in mission control. Basically, they're faced with a pending disaster. They had to figure out what to do to get them home. The command module was called Odyssey, and it made it safely back to Earth with all three occupants alive and well. Cold, but alive and well. What about the rest of the Apollo hardware? Well, the third stage of the Saturn V, which gets them on the way to the moon, after it had accelerated them to the point where they were at Earth escape velocity so they could make it to the moon, the final stage of the Saturn V rocket doesn't have anything else to do, so it was given one last task to perform, and that was it was crashed into the moon. In other words, it was following uh, essentially a parallel course to the command and service module and the lunar module, and they decided to crash it into the moon such that they could see what the Apollo 12 seismometers did. So Apollo 12, the previous mission, had left seismometers on the surface of the moon, and by crashing the final stage of the Saturn V of Apollo 13 into the moon, they had a known mass hitting the moon at a known position with a known speed because they could track the rocket on its way to the moon. So they had a very good calibration of how the moon responded to that particular impact. In fact, the moon, it seemed, rang like a bell for quite a while thereafter. But it's a very uh, convenient way of getting a calibration of how much the moon responded to a mass moving at a given speed, impacting the moon at a given point. They learnt quite a lot about the nature of the lunar crust by doing that. But regarding the lunar module itself, Aquarius, the lifeboat if you like, that was jettisoned just before the astronauts returned to Earth. And it would have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at the same time because they were following the same trajectory. They were heading for Earth and when the command module separated from Aquarius they both would have gone into the Earth's atmosphere. Now Aquarius is a very fragile craft that's not designed to go through the Earth's atmosphere, unlike the command module. So it would have disintegrated. But there was one thing they had to worry about. It was important to ensure that the re-entry of Aquarius, the lunar module, was controlled to ensure that any surviving components fell into the deepest part of the South Pacific, the Tonga Trench. Why did they worry about that if Aquarius is so fragile? Well, that's because they figured that some parts of it would actually survive. Possibly the engine, but that's not particularly important. What they were really worried about was the plutonium on board. So here is an Apollo 12 picture of Alan Bean removing the plutonium fuel cask from the lunar module, the descent, mo uh, descent stage of the lunar module. That plutonium cask is then put into this device close to his feet. This is called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or an RTG. 
And that plutonium effectively provides power for all of the surface experiments that will be going on during the landing, but also for hopefully many months thereafter. Remember, you can't have solar panels powering your experiments, or at least in principle you could, but that means the experiments would be off for half the time. Remember, the lunar surface will be in darkness for two weeks and in sunlight for two weeks as the moon goes around the Earth. So in order to keep all of the lunar surface experiments going all of the time, rather than just du during the time when the sun is above the horizon, they use these plutonium fuel casks which effectively stay on the surface of the moon. They're designed, because they've got a half-life of a few decades, they're designed to keep the experiments running in principle for years, and then eventually they will decay until they're safe. But unlike every other lunar module, this lunar module came back to Earth. So it was generally designed to be safe to leave on the moon. But if you're coming back to Earth, you have to make sure that plutonium doesn't land somewhere you don't want it to land, which is why they very carefully made sure that Aquarius came down essentially over the deepest part of the South Pacific Ocean, such that if the plutonium canister survived, which it probably did, it would sink to the bottom of the deepest trench in the South Pacific. And as far as we know, that's where it still is. At the end of the film, we see Tom Hanks there on the right being greeted by the captain of the USS Iwo Jima. And who is playing the captain on the left hand side? None other than Jim Lovell himself. So there's Jim Lovell, the astronaut, shaking hands with Jim Lovell, or at least Tom Hanks playing. Jim Lovell. A nice touch on the part of the director there at the end of the film. Interesting to see that the astronauts didn't really know what all the fuss was about. They were too busy trying to keep warm for those four days and deal with all of the problems they had with the power, the water, the carbon dioxide, etc. So when they eventually made it back to Earth and were lifted out of the Pacific Ocean and onto the rescue ship USS Iwo Jima, they were greeted by a few papers that were a few hours old, presumably, saying that the astronauts are safe. And they then found out what sort of public interest there was in getting the astronauts home. Not only that, uh, you can also see the, the flight plan at the bottom there with the bottom of the paper, but I think even more interesting is the fact that they've presumably only been on Earth now for a few hours and they're already signing the autographs of the various pictures. I don't know which astronaut that is, but presumably it's one of them who started the business of signing the various photographs that are going to get distributed. A couple of final points. One made me laugh when I found out about this. If we think about who built the Apollo spacecraft, a number of different companies built the Saturn V and the Apollo spacecraft itself, the command and service modules and the lunar module were made by two different companies. The command and service modules were made by North American Rockwell because the service module is so intimately linked to the command module, it, was, it made sense that they were both made by the same company. The lunar module had a completely different job to do, and that was built by the Grumman Aerospace Company. Remember the problem, the bang, the explosion, was in the service module. So the problem was in North American Rockwell's spacecraft. And how did they survive? By using the lunar module as a lifeboat. So the Grumman Aerospace Corporation provided the spacecraft, which in a sense saved the astronauts. And as a little bit of a tongue in cheek um, joke, workers at the Grumman Aerospace Corporation thought that they would make sure that North American Rockwell understood that Grumman were the heroes here in saving the astronauts. So Grumman decided to send North American Rockwell an invoice for the rescue. And the invoice looks something like this. I'm not going to go through all the details, but they sent the invoice to Houston via the USS Iwo Jima, the ship that picked them up. What were they charging? What were the Grumman employees charging the North American employees? Well, they charged them a towing fee. 
because Grumman effectively provided the spacecraft that towed the crippled command and service module home, they've charged them a towing fee, $4 for the first mile and $1 for each additional mile. That works out to approximately $400,000. They've written it as $400,004 because of that extra charge for the first mile. Uh, there's a few other bits and pieces. They charged them for charging the batteries, basically, because power was used from the lunar module and cables were sent from the lunar module into the command module to keep some of the, uh, of the uh, equipment in the command module going using power from the lunar module, especially at the end when they needed to power up the command module, they used the lunar module batteries. So there was a battery charge using, using the, the customer's jump cables. There's an accommodation charge because people were sleeping in the lunar module. So they've been charged for sleeping accommodation for two. And of course, the accommodation in the lunar module, it doesn't have any TV, unlike most motels. But it was air conditioned, which is fair enough. And it did have a radio, but perhaps most importantly, it had a hell of a view. So they were charged. How much for that? Well, that was already prepaid because that's part of the standard mission to have two people in the lunar module. But of course, in Apollo 13, they didn't have two people in the lunar module. They had three people in the lunar module. So they've been charged additional guest in room at $8 per night. So that's an additional $32. Nice idea. There's a few other bits and pieces. They gave them the water for free and they've given them a little bit of a discount and no tax has been added because it's all part of a government contract, which I thought was a nice idea. Apparently, the um, employers at Grumman and North American were not impressed, but the workers somewhere further down the line who actually sent it directly from one set to another, they thought it was a good idea and it was taken in all good jest. Let me just finish with an epilogue. This is Odyssey. This is the command module of Apollo 13 being rescued on the ship USS Iwo Jima. It usually has thermal coatings on the outside. This sort of mylar material is there to try and keep the material, uh, keep the people inside under some sort of temperature control. So the uh, clearly the walls of the uh, of the command module are relatively thick, but in order that it can go through um, on the way to the moon three days out, three days back and not get completely roasted by the sun, it has this protective mylar coating. Most of it, you notice, has been stripped away because re-entry is a fairly violent affair and as well as the heat shield itself getting rather cooked, a lot of this mylar material has been stripped away. But before the command module goes into a museum, which is usually what happens to these things, it was tidied up by the remainder of this mylar material being removed. You can see there's quite a few square meters of it. And it wasn't simply thrown away. Somebody had the bright idea. If you're going to remove parts of a command module before it goes uh, into a museum, why not take all that material and sell it? And that's precisely what they did. The material went into a lot of museums. Museums took quite a substantial part of a square meter and they cut it up into lots of small pieces and then sold it to people like me. So I have a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the coverings of the command module of Apollo 13 because they were made available to various American, various American museums who then cut it up into small pe uh, pieces and sold it for quite a few dollars per piece for those who want to collect a little bit of memorabilia. Essentially, the outer coatings of the command modules of a number of different missions are available. Apollo 11, Apollo 13, etc. The one I've just showed you is part of Apollo 13. So I have a little piece of Odyssey, a little piece of history. Another piece of history occurred in 2015. That was the 45th anniversary of the Apollo 13 um, I'm 
I can't call it a disaster because, of course, it wasn't. It was a, a catastrophe, but luckily all of the individuals survived. And here are all the major players. Charlie Duke, an astronaut. We have uh, Lovell and Hayes himself. Unfortunately, Swigert died uh, a decade or so after Apollo 13, but Lovell and Hayes survive. And with the microphone there, that's Gene Krantz, one of the flight directors, who, amongst others, was responsible for getting the astronauts home. Then we have other flight directors. Remember, there isn't just one flight director, they work in shifts. We have flight directors Lunny and Griffin, and we have other astronauts who sometimes acted as uh, capsule communicators. We have uh, Vance Brand, Luzma, and Kerwin at the end there. So this is the lineup for 2015. As far as I know, most of these individuals are still alive. I think one of these is unfortunately passed away. And of course, because we're talking about an event that occurred in the 1970s, most of these gentlemen are now in their 90s. I think Lovell is in his mid 90s and virtually everybody else is in their late 80s or early 90s. And it's one hell of a lineup. Perhaps we will not see the likes of this sort of lineup again. As I think Krantz said at the time, although it was an accident, although it was a disaster in the technical sense, the fact that the efforts of mission control got them home, you could argue, was NASA's finest hour. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.